Mustang. Mustang is coming. Mustang is coming April 17th. The unexpected, the new Ford Mustang at your Ford dealers. It came in with a stampede, but began with stealth. In October of 1962, a mid-engine two-seater Ford prototype made several demonstration runs at Watkins Glen Raceway during the U.S. Grand Prix. This showing launched one of the most covert design and production plans in American automotive history. Division Chief Lee Iacocca had been convinced from 1961 that the American market was ready for a very new product. At the 1964 World's Fair in New York, the Pony Car was launched. Originally named the Cougar, the Adventura, Allegra, Stiletto, Torino, and X-T-Bird, the world came to know the Mustang. The love affair for the Ford Mustang remains one of the most intriguing automotive seductions ever to embrace America. Welcome to American Seduction, the Mustang Mystique. In 2006, Ford released the design of their 67 Mustang body to Dynacorn International. For Ford, this was a first. GM had already jumped into the game two years earlier with the release of the 69 Camaro convertible and coupe. Their success put demands on Ford to follow suit. My name is Matt Cooper. I'm the owner of Autoworks International and also part owner of Cooper Design. We spend a lot of our time replacing and uh, repairing uh, rusty body shells that customers bring into us because there's nothing else available. And when you're talking in a 35 to 40 year old car, it makes it really difficult to find something that's not been beat up or rusty or been in an accident. So now the um, introduction of this replacement body shell is great because now we can get something out of a crate and start bolting parts on it. So why the desire to build a complete car? Well, what prompted this Mustang build was that we had already built a Camaro on Chop, Cut and Rebuild. And we wanted to show the general population what we could do with one of our new Mustang bodies. Man, what a lot of stuff here. <laughs> Where do you start? Yeah. Let's do the paper. Start with the hood, I guess, huh? Yeah. First of all, we looked at the hood. They've got a new um, composite hood that has a metal frame underneath it. We looked at that, then we looked at the fenders and various other parts they sent us down, and went through the list to make sure that we had all the parts we needed for today's build. We first started putting the hood hinges on, and then we proceeded to put the hood on, line that up, do a quick alignment on it. We just wanted to do a rough line so that we would know how much work was going to be involved to uh, get the car nice and straight and with all the lines to match. There's over 20,000 components in a Mustang. Our body shells for Mustang and indeed Camaro as well are sold as restoration body shells or to rebody an old car. There are those that are going to build cars from the ground up, but for ease of, of application, they're sold as a restoration body part. Calling the shells a body part is an important distinction. It's not a kit car or a knockoff. This car doesn't come complete. Every part has to be purchased separately and not every single part is available. Some salvage work is required. The idea is if you already have a 67 Mustang, even a rust bucket, a new shell is a cost-effective way to restore it. There's obviously always adjustment you have to go and do after you put the piece on, and I think it's going to be minimal. Well, back in the 60s, they had uh, different technology back then. The, uh, they used a thinner grade of sheet metal. Uh, they used a U.S. standard sheet metal. Now we've got a universal standard. They're using a thicker gauge metal, and it's really a much stiffer chassis all around. Reproducing a body that's been on the road for over 40 years means engineers can improve on flaws that took years to discover. Those millions of cars produced in the late 60s were the ideal lab rats for Dynacorn's objectives. They used a 67.8 style convertible pan, so it's now a one-piece uh, floor pan, uh, and the seat pan goes across, so it's reinforced better. They added the 68 torque boxes in it as well, as well as the 69 shock towers. Uh, so they basically opened up the engine compartment just a little bit more, so you've got some more room, you've got something that's much more stiffer, uh, and it's definitely performance oriented. Not every part will be a perfect fit. Massaging is always a requirement. The challenge is to make certain each part pulls them toward the correct location for the next, not further the other way. An eighth of an inch at the front can become three or four inches at the back. So, pre-fitting early on is an extremely important exercise. Every one of these parts will come off and on many times before this job is done. This car will be unique because it will be a 100% manufactured restoration part car. A true challenge, a unique car. The team, the tools, and now the parts are all in place. Time to pony up.
The Mustang became a true international star within months of its release. 417,000 units were sold in the first year. Bold numbers, but humble on power. The first Mustang had the same 101 horsepower engine as the Ford Falcon. In 65, more star power arrived. Illustrious automotive designer Carroll Shelby attached his name and talent to the Mustang. By 1967, the Shelby GT500 had the muscle and style to take on any car in its class. The little six-cylinder now had a big block 428 fire-breathing big brother. That same car was later featured in the hit movie Gone in 60 Seconds as the famous Eleanor. With sheet metal prepped and primed, power is in need of some focus. The mock-up block for us is a very easy and simple way in order to um, get an engine and sit it in the car. And because it's a brand new body from Dynacorn, we want to make sure that everything is in the correct place. When we go to bolt the, uh, the correct engine in place, it'll fit. We lifted the engine into the car the easy way, just by manpower instead of having to use a forklift or a cherry picker. The motor mounts that we're using for this build we haven't used before. They were a prototype, and this is the first time we've got a chance to be able to put them into a car from when they were originally drawn up. So because they're adjustable, it makes it very easy to slide the engine backwards and forwards and left to right for header clearance or for transmission mounting or whatever you might need to do for clearance. A quarter inch here, an eighth there, flexibility is something that most builders love to have. What we did next was go ahead and take out the factory body filler from the seams. We used oxygen acetylene in a very low heat with a wire brush in order to remove the body filler. We find that's the easiest way to get rid of the uh, excess body filler. And then we went ahead and welded up the seams in order that the two metal would not move under the body filler and then cause cracking later on. So in doing that, we're gonna have a better finished project. So after I went ahead and welded up the body seams, Miguel went ahead and put in um, one type of body filler, which is a base material. And then when he was done with that, he went over with a, um, a finished body filler. It isn't a necessary step, but some practices are hard to abandon. When we were working on the rear valance, we decided that we were going to weld up the seams to make a cleaner appearance. And then in doing that, we might as well just take the bolts out and then weld up the holes where the bolts were as well. Knowing where this Mustang is headed, Matt intends to give the best he can deliver. We took the original dash in the Dynacon car and cut it out with the plasma cutter. And also we used a cutoff wheel, that's the easiest way to remove it. One dashboard. The interior that we're looking at right now is going to be all Cooper Design original. Uh, one piece headliner, a different type of dash uh, that will appear original but it's a little bit bigger and a little bit different. An original headliner in a Mustang has a bow type situation that it just has a sewed type fabric and you have to glue it in. This is going to be a one piece headliner that is going to fit up into the place of the original headliner, look more like a new car rather than the old 60s styling that it used to have. A solid headliner also leaves room for some overhead creativity. We were installing the RRS suspension today and they come from Australia. They've done um, a lot of R&D on the suspension that we installed today in order to make it basically the best that's on the market and that's why we use it. When we originally started the uh, project, we went ahead and installed the rear suspension cross member which was also going to house the upper shock mounts and also the equal length watts linkage. Then we went to the center and installed the um, torque arm cross member, which is up near the rear of the transmission. After doing that, we went ahead and did some welding on the car. When the 67 Mustangs are built, they usually use spot welds and small welds here and there. We like to weld up the complete car anywhere we can. We weld it up, it stiffens up the chassis. In installing this new type of suspension, the um, RRS has designed it so it can be a direct bolt-in, which is pretty much what we did today. So you don't have to weld it in place, you don't have to really cut anything, all that you're doing is getting a drill and drilling all the holes, 5 16 and 3 8 bolt holes in order to install it. It doesn't fit factory holes, but then which factory are we talking about? If there's one piece of Ford technology that's managed to hang on over the years, this is it. Mustang's rack and pinion steering seems like it will last forever. So we went ahead and installed the struts. 
put the top nuts on, then we moved into putting the uh, lower arms in place, then went ahead and installed the spindles that already had the rotors on them. Machined rather than foundry components will give this Stang a hot performance look. After we got those components installed, we went ahead and put the brake calipers on the left and right sides. When we installed the RRS3 link in the rear, it differs from the original one, whereas they would have had leaf springs left and right and just two shock absorbers. So the handling of this suspension is far superior in the way that it would keep the pinion angle correct and also the ride height is adjustable via the coil over shock absorbers. Don't look for that 60s sway when this machine goes down the road. This is one tight setup. We're very happy with the suspension and the way that it went together today. It's uh, as normal when we're installed, it's very simple, so we're very pleased with today's work. Ford has a better idea. By 1969, it seemed every American auto manufacturer was in the chase. They all wanted the pony class. But Ford wasn't ready to surrender. The competition was creative and fierce. The Z28, the Hemi, Ford counterpunched with Cobra Jet, and the Boss had taken over. And Mustang's body design was about to get bigger. To this day, the 69 Mach 1 is one of the most cherished Mustangs ever to roll off the line. Consumers were lured with a wide variety of power, from the small block 302 to a booming 428 Cobra Jet. The famous shaker hood scoop had eyes riveted when it roared, joining power with aesthetic. The battle for muscle superiority was impending. When 1970 arrived, Dearborn designers were loaded and ready. Putting power to the ground is a challenge for every builder. Yes, there are formulas and equations, but experience is often the best calculated move. We were uh, asked by Matt at AutoWorks International to build them a differential for a uh, car that they're building in their shop. We uh, started out by uh, building the pinion support. Precision is vital to getting the most from a pumpkin. The wrong ratio means tossing horsepower. And then we took the ring gear and pressed it onto the carrier. And then we installed the uh, ring gear bolts, which hold the ring gear onto the carrier. And we torqued those down to spec. Next was to install that into the third member case, and then you put the carrier into it and set the backlash on it. Basically took the uh, pinion support back out, um, put a new O-ring on it that keeps the oil seal from the pinion support to the carrier tight so you don't leak oil. The power coming into this third member won't be punishing, but it'll be more than intended back in 67. Next, we torque down the uh, carrier bolts that hold on the main caps to the third member case. Torque those down to spec. At this point, the third member was done. After that, we moved on to assembling the axles and then uh, moved over to the press to press on the axle bearings and the retaining plates. Matt had asked us to use a custom perch on there that matches their, uh, their special suspension assembly. We didn't consider the clearance for the T-bolts into the, uh, that retain the axles into the housing. So we had to clearance the perches for that. And then we moved on to installing the uh, brake backing plates onto the housing. And uh, then we installed the axles um, inserting them and bolting them in. So is an eight inch the best choice for this car? If you're running it on slicks, it's probably a good time to go step up to a nine inch rear end. Um, if you're running on street tires or autocrossing, um, sticky road race tires, an eight inch should be uh, just fine with a 31 spline upgrade to handle those tire applications. Yes, we know, most muscle maniacs would insist on a nine inch diff. Even bowtie builders opt for Ford's signature rear end without much thought into the decision. But the eight inch is a lighter component and given the choice of a 302 small block, the power to weight ratio might just be a superb choice. Today we tried a new idea. Instead of use, using U-bolts to hold the rear end in, we decided to machine a plate, get it welded to the rear end and just bolt the rear end that way. 
So the install was a little unknown until we put it in. Dealing with the unknown can be half the fun. Ah, the torque arm is part of the R suspension. What it does is it bolts up to the uh, rear housing, uh, bolts up on the front pinion shaft, and it connects up to their cross-member bracket. Uh, it's got two points on it that are completely adjustable, so if you need to raise it or lower it for clearances uh, and for your suspension to handle, that's what it's there for. Uh, after that, we finished raising it up and connected the shock so it could hang in the air and be suspended. Uh, from there, we connected up the torque arms to the back of the rear end, uh, and to the trailing arms. This is fast becoming not your average 67 Mustang. On the front, we went up uh, and installed the strut rod pockets. Then at that point, we went ahead and installed the uh, strut rods into the pockets. Finding if the fit of basic components works or not is an ongoing process. Everything short of a startup will be installed, then blown completely apart. And then when it comes to the final install, after everything's detailed, we use all the correct hardware, Loctite and all that sort of stuff for the final install. The one thing I could think I look forward to more than anything is the day that Matt hands me the keys and says, here's your car. That day isn't far off. During the 60s, the Mustang was truly a star. But the 70s proved to be a storm that the muscled-up Stang couldn't endure. The horsepower race was coming to a quick halt. Dissension was rife in Dearborn. Henry Ford II swung the axe, as 1971 marked the end of the boss and Ford President Bunky Knudsen. The 71 model was longer and 800 pounds heavier than the original Mustang. The Boss 302 and 429 were now history. In their place, a 351 pushing 330 horsepower still satisfying the passion for performance. But Iacocca was convinced that performance had killed the pony car. The 1971 Boss 351 was the last true muscle the Mustang would see for many years. Emission standards, even in 1967, required a full exhaust. That was and is the law. Where there's some wiggle room is sound, and few things sound better than a fine-tuned exhaust. Uh, I'm a Ford guy myself, so I, it's one of my favorite body styles. So it was kind of kind of neat and exciting to, to work on something like that. Jamie isn't an installer. He's a designer, one of the best. So if he's excited, you know good things are going to happen. The headers that I designed were uh, built specifically for uh, Ford Mavericks. Um, since Ford uses such a uh, similar uh, chassis on all their early cars, uh, they fit the Mustangs as well as the Falcons. Uh, starting from scratch on the exhaust, just have a bunch of uh, straight pipes and U-bends and just slowly just work your way back, building in a bunch of clearance. Um, essentially what we did is just install that, the Maverick headers and uh, built uh, the exhaust system around that with the next pipe. I generally use the next pipe uh, to equalize sound and it's also worth a couple horsepower. Uh, the sound I was going for was kind of a, a deeper tone. Uh, I think it'll fit the, the motor and um, give the car a nice, nice growl. But I still like to do everything by hand. I just like to make sure, I like to feel that it's tight and uh, I don't want to ruin any hardware. You have to build tons of room around everything for the clutch, for the brakes, the parking brake, stuff you don't see in the car, it's just a rolling chassis. So it's just trying to leave a bunch of clearance for everything and make it easy to work on. The separation between master and apprentice. Jamie knows he can make it fit. He's concerned with style and a sweet rumble to turn heads before you even see this Mustang coming. Uh, I take the prototype that's all cut and welded and uh, over to our bending department and they put it on a vector machine which measures the bends and then feeds that information to uh, one of our CNC vendors. I get bent pieces back and I just kind of cut them, cut the uh, X portion out and fit it to the car. We use the 14 by 9 by 14 inch uh, mufflers. That's pretty much a straight through design. Uh, it it kind of gives you a, a good mixture of power uh, but, and sound, but it doesn't resonate like some other mufflers do. 
Sending the prototype to a CNC machine means there's no Frankenstein piping. This exhaust is now one seamless tube. The tits I used are oval shaped and uh, I, I found that they fit the uh, rear valance the best. With the uh, cap bag installed, everything fits very well on it, lots of clearance. Uh, the fact that I can get a brand new 67 Mustang is uh, very cool. Love the old cars, and I don't have to get one that's all rusted out. And a complete stainless exhaust will help ensure it never does. With tightened emission restrictions, stricter safety standards, skyrocketing insurance premiums, and a gas crisis, the controversial Mustang II was released. And the unthinkable for some, the Mustang was not available with a V8. Motor Trend named it Car of the Year, and Lee Iacocca was ecstatic, calling the car his little jewel. Concessions had to be made, so revival of the Cobra name was a quick solution. Of all the model fixes, the Ghia II was one of the best fits to appeal to all factions. With a 302 V8 and lightened body from its 74 counterpart, it maintained pony car size and standards without all the flashy spoilers and decals of the King Cobra. A 2 plus 2 interior and opera windows added to its allure. Owners of the Mustang II were and remained passionate about their Mustangs, while many power zealots were embarrassed. One element can't be denied. Iacocca's little jewel rode the Mustang through this contentious period, carrying and delivering the pony car to its new Fox style in 1979. We took a production type core support that we use on our other Mustangs that we build. I altered it a little bit for the DSC2 car and then um, took the um, pattern that he brought over, checked it on the uh, core support, he made a few changes, and then we turn it into uh, what you've seen today. Thank you, sir. There you go. I shall cut them right away. I'll see you shortly. Thanks, right. Marty. Thanks, man. All right, man. We used quarter-inch aluminum. We put it on the table, clamped it down, and then proceeded to cut. Outsourcing components is a necessity, particularly when you have deadlines to deal with. So having Advantage water jet around the corner really is an advantage. State-of-the-art equipment is another bonus. A quick turnaround means the new radiator support is back in a flash and buttoned into place. Time to focus on more cushier jobs. The interior of this Mustang is where Matt and his crew intend to make the most dramatic departures from the original 67 look and feel. We put the seats in DSC2 in order to see how much clearance we had with the center console in there. It's a seat that's made by Procar and it's for Cooper Design. So we're working with Procar right now to come up with a better fitting Mustang seats so you can be comfortable in, in these older vehicles. Modernizing from the inside appeals most to those who view these cars as drivers. Trailer queens have a different take on the subject. And then we had Louis, he was working on the fiberglass part of the dash today, cutting out all the uh, holes for the gauges and the AC vents. We use Stuart Warner gauges in the uh, dash. I think they give it a great look and we're undecided at this point. Everyone likes the silver bezels and the silver background and the gauge, but I think we may be using a black gauge with a silver bezel, but still Stuart Warner. Color choices can come down the line. It's fit, not finish, that's the focus now. The dash that we used was from the Obsidian project, so we pulled another piece out of the mold, and because we have not installed that into another car yet, it's pretty much first time in the DSC2 car. So taking it from an altered state and putting it into a stock Mustang, that's been a little bit of a challenge, but we've managed to work through it. So altering the fiberglass in behind to accept different gauges and just basically finding a way to mount it into the car. This is awesome. This is a brand new, I did it, tilt steering column. 67 Mustang did have kind of a rear option for the steering column it was uh, a tilt away. So instead of it actually tilting up and down like this, when you open the door, the steering column would tilt away from you so that you could go and hit, get into the seat a little bit easier. But in this case, the tilt up and down is what we're really looking for. Um, we basically put it through the lower ball support that we installed earlier on in the day and then just mounted it up to the bottom of the dash using the stock uh, hardware and it went in very easy. They did it or I did it. Either way, it's the right part.
of the Ford Pavilion, there's a daydream corner called Mustang. This is the car that dreams are made of. Take your choice of a six or three V8s. Power steering, power brakes, automatic or standard transmission, dozens of options. But as standard equipment, you get bucket seats, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, all vinyl upholstery, padded instrument panel, and full wheel covers. Even though Mustang is a dream, its low price is a beautiful reality. Test drive one right now at your Ford dealers. The mid-80s were not kind to Mustang sales, barely touching 100,000 units per year. Mustang pride had become a whisper. A new plan was announced by Ford. The Mustang was on its way to becoming a front-wheel drive car, derived from the Mazda. Mustang pride suddenly turned into anger, with hundreds of thousands of letters sent to Dearborn. In its 25th year of production, Mustang enthusiasts were able to ride again with some glory. The 5.0-liter engine was seeking vengeance in a market Ford had nearly squandered away. The convertible saw sales roar. Mustang owners weren't going to let their pony car go out with a whimper. Not with GT and LX models claiming the quarter mile in 14 seconds. Realizing a winner, Ford execs decided front-wheel drive was perhaps better suited for the 89 Probe. Sooner or later, big decisions have to be made. At some point, aesthetics need to be dealt with. The exterior is going to be um, not quite what people are used to looking at. With the DSC2 car, I had in mind to do it, um, you know, something that everyone's going to notice, so I went with the candy red. So we went ahead and um, got with House of Color, decided what color they want uh, that we wanted to go with, and they went ahead and sent it out to us so we could, uh, you know, carry on with shooting the car. Because it's a candy color, it's really best to paint everything all at once. But uh, sometimes we have um, space issues within the booth because we have to have enough room to walk all the way around the car and to do the job that we need to do and get back and look to see how the candies are going on. So unfortunately, we couldn't fit everything into the booth uh, this time. Candy. It's a word that many painters try not to use, and some wish they'd never heard of it. This is the basically the first brand new 67 Mustang um, since 1967, so it is a big deal. We wanted people to notice it. Candy isn't like shooting paint. It's more like shooting with window stain. Whenever you shoot a candy type color, there's, there's extra steps that you have to take. So we went ahead and put down two to three coats of sealer, two to three coats of mid, and then two to three coats of candy, depending on what the color was that I was trying to achieve. The idea of the Dynacorn DSC2 is not to do what we normally do and go with outrageous horsepower. It's gonna be the drivability, the look of the car, the fit, the finish, the whole package that is usable, just like the original 67 Mustang would have been, except we just with a little more pop. Wes is our guy for doing all the graphic artistry. He's the one that designs everything in my direction. Uh, Dynacorn had expressed they wanted some graphics or some sort of running horse or something like that on the hood, so I got West to design something for me that I liked. We emailed over the, um, the basically the renderings of three different hoods. They chose the one they liked best, and that's the one we went for. Painting an icon isn't a normal day at the office. We want to make it so it doesn't jump out. Someone really needs to be looking at the car, appreciating it, and then they're going to actually notice that there's a little bit more work on the hood than maybe first caught their eye. Years of experience have given Wes a steady hand, a loyal list of clients, and some prestigious opportunities. He knows being subtle will get more admiration than big, bright, and bold will ever achieve when the light shines on this work. The new millennium saw Mustang return to its roots. Labeled as retrofuturism, Mach 1s were back and the Cobra returned. If life begins at 40, then Mustang was about to be reborn. Monogram floor mats and a 40th anniversary logo beside the shifter accentuated the regained esteem. Power was back in the Mustang playbook. Candy apple red and ready. Reassembly is an exciting time for any builder, but the excitement has to be tempered with care. Painted parts are too delicate to toss around. From last time then, when we worked on the suspension, it was mocked up, nothing was really tight, so at that point, and looking at the way that it looked under the car, 
I could choose a color that would go well with the, um, the candy red that we used on the body and the underside of the car. So, so we painted all the suspension components and had them prepped and ready for today's install. We started the rear install of the suspension with the um, centerpiece of the Watts linkage. And then we went ahead and put in the uh, lower control arms, hooked them to the rear uh, brackets that hold the shocks and the control arms. Then we put in the uh, center section. The hardest part of installing the three link suspension components in the rear end is to position the actual third member axle housing up inside there without scratching anything. They're very difficult, it's a heavy piece and we were able to manhandle it and get it up in there without damaging anything. The axle housing we installed was an eight inch rear end, but it also has 31 spline axles. So that makes it, uh, you know, one of a kind right now. And we're gonna test this and see how it works, but it's a really good setup because you get a lighter rear end. It's easier for the engine and trans to turn it. It takes less horsepower, but yet it's very, very strong. Giving aid to the smaller differential is a reinforced suspension and stiffening system that keeps as much power as possible going to where it belongs. I would say, you know, there's usually a, an easy side of a job and a hard side of a job. And for some reason, the hard side of the job never materialized. Um, we were able to go right through it and take care of business. Sometimes it's the fact that reassembly takes the guesswork away. Other times, you're just plain lucky. Some things shouldn't be overanalyzed. First of all, we installed the steering rack underneath the car, did up all the hardware on that, and then we moved to the lower control arms. In 67, the brake setups, you would have had a couple of options for the front at least. You would have had drum brakes or disc brakes. They could have been a four piston, depending on which ones you ordered, and the rear would have been drum brakes. The drum in its day was a very good brake, but now with the um, performance driving that people want to do and the look behind the big wheels that we're gonna use, we definitely wanna use disc brakes. Upgrading the stopping system on any vintage car is a sensible tactic. No one is proud when they slide through an intersection smoking some old school brake shoes. The original sway bar on the Mustang was probably somewhere in the vicinity of a, a three quarter inch sway bar. We went with a seven eighths or a one inch depending on um, you know how I want the car to handle. So whatever it is now, we might try it and then even upgrade it again. Because we were so fortunate to mock up this car again before, um, before we you know, went ahead with it, the front suspension went really, really well. We did that, I think, in about 37 minutes. We had a little side bet going, so, you know, we were pretty proud of that. Who says you have to make a living just from customers? Ken came in today and helped us install the new Boss 750 EFI system. It's a fuel injection system that allows you to bolt on to a older intake manifold. I think the first thing we need to do, Brian, is figure out what we're gonna do uh, today to get this engine in the car. The engine was supplied by Summit Racing. When we got it out of the crate, we decided that you normally come with a black block, so we decided to paint it red, you know, color match to the car. It's a 302 cubic inch, making about 350 horsepower. So it's, it's not made to be a super screamer, but really nice, dependable driver. After we got the engine um, set up on the floor, ready to install the parts, we started with the intake manifold, cleaning that all up, getting the gaskets ready with the silicone sealant and installing that. Then I believe we went through to the valve covers. The Serpentine setup is from March. Um, they make a really nice unit in the fact that it's a direct bolt-on, lightweight, looks good, it comes complete with all the hardware that you need, and um, you know it gives the the engine a more up upgraded look. After we got the engine wrapped up, we went on to the, the clutch and the flywheel. The clutch and the flywheel was supplied by Southland Clutch, and we went ahead and installed that, no problems at all. It was a 26 spline to match up to the transmission. Louis went ahead and painted up the bell housing for us, so that's all done. Hey, we had a surprise visit from Tony at Astro. He happened to be in town and, and dropped by right at the right minute when we were ready to put the transmission onto the back of the bell housing. Because generally a T5 is a lighter transmission and it can't handle the horsepower and torque, but the, with the way that Astro builds it, it is now a beefier transmission, but it's still lightweight. And that's what we're after for this build.
Installing an engine and a transmission into a painted car is usually fairly difficult because there's lots of areas that can get hit and marked, you know, in coming in contact with each other. So the number one thing with that um, core support removed that we designed earlier, now we can come in on a better angle so the transmission fits through the tunnel. But in doing so, still the precautions were made. We put plenty of wrap around everything to make sure that uh, I did not nick any of the paint or do any scratches. After we had the engine sitting in place and we had the uh, transmission mount mocked up and you know the bolts weren't exactly tight yet but everything was in place, we had to go ahead and install our adjustable motor mount kit. Again, if the car was just like a little bit higher on the rack or a little bit lower, it would have made the job easier. So we'll be sure not to put it in that location again. Oh, I don't know. I think eye level is the perfect height to admire this package. Mustang teamed up and branded with more star power partners than any other American car. Of all the variant partnerships, none have captured Mustang's passion more than the acclaimed Roush or Superstar Shelby models. Legendary designer Carroll Shelby brought his GT design to Mustang in 1965 to begin the most celebrated and marketable partnership in American automotive history. When Shelby parted ways with Ford in 1969, the die was already cast. From his high-performance 289 GT350 to the return of the GT500 in 2005, the meanest, most expensive Mustangs were built under the Shelby banner. Former Ford engineer Jack Roush has created some of the most riveting and magnificent handling Mustangs ever produced. The 2006 Roush Stage 3 kicks out well over 400 horsepower. The suspension, with Roush proprietary tuning, delivers the full allure of Mustang appeal. An exotic ride without an elitist price tag. At this stage of a build, an inventory of what's on hand is vital. Best to know now if anything was left in the booth or not painted at all. Moving forward is the key. In the final thrash, as we call it, the, uh, the stress level is always high because there could be something that we forgot. The original uh, tail lights in the uh, vehicle, I think they had 1157 bulbs in them, which is a two filament bulb. One filament stays on for the uh, tail light, and then when you press on the brake or put the turn signal on, another filament will now light up to make the light brighter. Um, so now we've gone to a sequential LED setup. So now there's many, many little LEDs inside the lights, which make them much brighter and obviously more visible, which in turn makes it safer. And that's some of the upgrades that we've done to this car for safety. True enthusiasts know the taillights on classic cars, especially from the 60s. It's a signature of the model, make, and year. The Mustang maniacs will spot a fraud on the most revered years of their pride and joy. Keeping the look faithful is an absolute must. Improving safety with LED technology won't take away from the look. Anything that'll keep them off your rear end goes to the front of the to-do list. We went and checked the final fit on the rear bumper after all the panels were on and everything was set up. And we were gonna send it out to the chrome shop, but I'm not sure now, it might turn into a painted piece. I think we're gonna go with a uh, monochrome look of the car, at least on the front and the rear bumper. I think it'll kind of jazz it up a little. We decided to go with a bigger fuel tank that was originally uh, equipped in the vehicle. Instead of a 16, we went with a 22 gallon. So the tank height is a little bit, um, you know, higher inside the trunk, so the filler neck didn't fit. The filler neck for the gas, we basically just measured it up, put it in there as a rough fit, and then we took it over, uh, cut off the filler neck, bead rolled it, and then we put a new rubber coupler in there and did up all the hose clamps and it was good to go. We also installed the upper vents on the uh, quarter panels, and then we installed also the lower side vents too that were originally probably gonna be some sort of brake ducting, but on the uh, factory cars, they're just a nice little panel that inserts in there. Side vents on the 1967 were all look rather than function. We also got a nice addition today. We got a crate that arrived and it had the uh, brand new tinted um, rear window glass, the side glass and the new windshield um, from Highway Classics or California Mustang. Then we had Glenn from AG Auto Glass come in and installed it for us in the project as well.
One of the main things that we changed on the very front of the vehicle is the aluminum core support. It just bolts in and out, so we can put the engine in a lot easier and that sort of thing, so that's one of the reasons why we went with that. When you build a project like this, there's always plenty of people behind the scenes and there's vendors that supply the parts, there's people that supply help with the parts because uh, they designed them, they built them, and now we're fitting them to the vehicle. There's, there's, there's people that just supply nuts and bolts for the project. I mean, everyone matters. Giving credit to all hands on any project built this meticulously isn't just the right thing to do. It's mandatory if you ever want to walk down this road again. The seduction the Mustang has had over its admirers is more like a marriage than a romance. Through good times and bad, America could not part with the Mustang. Years later, the past has merged with the future, and the classic is a classic all over again. With retro techno aesthetics and a state-of-the-art platform, the new GT wears Phil Clark's original pony badge with enduring pride. The Mustang is stampeding again. With Ford authorized pressings online, the iconic 67 Fastback can be perfectly replicated once again. Of course, a new 67 has multiple possibilities, from GT500 clones, new big block technology, or even a reliable basic daily driver with a sweet 302. It all depends on the dream or the pocketbook. The time has come to deliver to the masses. Will this modern 67 catch the eye, the awe, or the ire of Mustang purists? When people walk up to this car, what they're going to be seeing, first of all, at a show, is they're going to, it's going to appear to be, from a distance, a 67 Mustang Fastback. Um, as they get closer and closer, they'll see that things aren't always what they appear. I am Michael Loletta, I'm car show chairman of the San Diego Mustang Club, and we're at the fourth annual San Diego Mustang Car Show. Well, this show brings out the best of all the years of Mustangs. There's a lot of interest in the late model Mustangs. A lot of the newer Mustangs have become very popular. Uh, people can personalize them. My name is Wayne Cook, and I've been technical editor at Mustang and Ford's magazine for 10 years. Oh, it's the best I've ever seen. Absolutely um, meticulous in every way, shape, and form, and a lot of additional features that you don't really see or don't really think of were incorporated into the build so that when someone really gets out and drives this car, they're going to they're gonna feel the difference. I, like, I really like the, um, the Mustang in the back. I don't know if that's been painted on or decals. It's been embedded in the, in the clear. You know, some people don't know what the car is, but they love it anyway. In fact, I was coming around the side, and I seen a, a, a mother and a child, and the little child was actually kissing the car. I was going to say, hey, get away from there, but uh, you know, I let them have that one for free. <laughs> What our body shells, and specifically the 67 Mustang body shell means this marketplace is all of a sudden you've got a whole brand new platform in which to do anything you want with it. You can build, once again, you can build a brand new car, you can replace an old car. It gives people an opportunity to, to have a 67 Mustang um, and not have to spend the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars um, to buy one and then spend another thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 fixing it. Um, Ford has built the car, year one has built the car. Um, Sammy Hagar's brand new Red Rocker is one of our body shells. Um, but this one's ours. Whether it's retro futurism direct from the dealer or a new classic custom built for an enthusiast, builders and buyers need not beware. The Mustang mystique lives on and American seduction thundering into the future.